Um, and it actually has been helpful even for myself to go back and review. So um, just to let you know that we'll be recording this message, this uh, session. So today we're going to talk about um, and some just some takeaways. Thank you for your feedback last week. We're going to try and address some of those things um, that you talked about. Um, a lot of you said you wanted to hear from people, so I did reach out to a few of you. Um, uh, and then I'm not sure if um, Julie has made it in because she also got a, a, a notice that she was uh, that it was canceled, but she might be phoning in. Um, so she hasn't been part of these sessions, but she does have a lot of experience. So I thought you might want to hear from somebody else who has experience teaching a fairly large class. Netta, I've heard. Report you get the department. I was like, wow, she's doing extension of CPI. Thank you. <laughs> so if um, so at the end, well, um, I didn't officially put you on. So you're still welcome to like bail out if you want to. But I'd love to hear what you're thinking. And maybe we could just do a little bit of share back. Um, and then I did invite other people if they want to, but they don't have to. Nobody's name is officially on the agenda um, to say what you're thinking about. And then we'll just talk about next steps and what um, the rest of the summer could look like for us. Uh, just to remind you that all of these recordings and PowerPoints and additional readings and resources are all available um, on our special interest and workshop site. Um, it's a little bit of a content dump right now, but we'll be spending the summer refining it and making it look like, uh, very navigable. But right now you can still go back and review any of the videos, um, the recordings that have happened um, and access the links that we talk about in any of these sessions. So please um, just remember that those are there for your reference. And so look at how far we've come. Um, we are um, on our set, the fourth session. So we're going to talk about building a framework. We're going to address some gaps. And then I'm going to, that's when I'm going to open up and we'll hear from some examples, um, hopefully from Julie and Netta and maybe some other people. Um, so this is a beautiful slide that uh, Madeline created. So I'm, Madeline, I think you explained it really well the last time. So I'm going to give it to you but it, it makes sense to me as well. So please take it away and I'll jump in if needed. For sure. So um, as we were, were thinking about some of the questions that people are saying, ready. On timeline. kind of 
August will be really busy. So we want all the people who have come to all these great sessions to really get in there. Um, and uh, then the next piece is in terms of your course introduction, it would be fabulous if you are able to provide the students with that first kind of intro module that they can get into. You don't have to publish your whole entire site. You could publish just here's the overview of the course. Uh, maybe you do an intro video, maybe you email the students to say, hey, check out the course. In some of these instances, you might find that students want to check out what your course is going to be like and make sure it fits within what they're going to be able to do as students moving for, through the semester. And maybe they need to make a tweak to their schedule. So that's a, that's a piece for us providing students with that empowerment and that flexibility in terms of them designing their own learning experience as well. Uh, here too, if you have your course outline that's already prepared and you're able to get it to the library, they're able to pull all of those resources and make them linked right into your Sakai course. This is particularly important now, given all copyright and access to information and all of those pieces. If you have chapters that you're thinking you'd like to use, link with the library, they can help you get that all sorted out so that you're not having to do that uh, yourself, but you have that collaboration. Looking at doing this. and what those seminars that's definitely okay to provide instructors with the students are like the forums hours you've done is maybe this is like maybe ideal but I also start stop continue A design map for yeah. a lot of people asked about how how do we use forums and so I have a link to later on so we'll definitely give you those resources in a bit Which is a great question. Putting our own children up. So that it's not. Colon, colony. Uh, You can think of it as an art. Start getting more in depth, but when you design your set, idea of like odd, but it also. work each week. Uh, do or a you let them focus so it, it's just sort of thinking Really is important to keep that um, mental between weeks at least uh, 
post. Maybe it's just um, so you they don't forget about. Wait, this happens um, that they. We The next slide. Uh, yeah. Beginning might be just a very. Concept within that theory. In topic three, you're your extra reading of assessment. The different course frameworks. If you watch the video or see the resources for the fourth year, we gave you some. communicate to students, but also a little asterisk next to readings because we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. And then what are the activities like the learning activities? And we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about how that can be framed, but I'll go to this slide. Um, that we found this great example. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, we often find that students like to have those visuals and it also just aligns with the principles of some students like to read it with a lot of words. Some people are very visual and want to um, kind of color code things and uh, print it out and put it on their bulletin board right in front of them. So having a, a bit of a framework for them to know is, is, okay, this is what this week is about. This is what I need to get accomplished. It's almost like a visual checklist for them to uh, really think about what's coming through the course. I also feel like this is a great way to even start your own planning. If you are anything like me, I have a piece of paper and I'm like, okay, what am I doing where and when, and how can I visually represent that? And then taking that and putting it right into your lessons within Sakai. So, you know, week one, you see all of these things around lecture, tutorial, quizzes, forums. So this is how I build out what that lesson looks like in Sakai. So it gives you a map and a framework of what you're doing in each one of those lessons. And we're not, we're, sorry, yeah, we don't ahead. have a, a link here, but I do want to address it and I will share the link out um, in a minute. But there, a lot of people are talking about what this looks like and how much time it takes. So Netta raises a good point about a conversation that she's having about like how much time does all this take and is how much is too much. So a lot of people are talking about, and we've mentioned this before about reframing the contact hour uh, as, as thinking about it learning amazing on the CPI team, create some uh, visuals. I just gave her my course outline. I said, what could you do with this to make it look interesting? So that was one example. It just gives the students an understanding of presentation is one of these months. I just tried to again something you could also use 
And part of your that just has flow charts. I'm all about the course outline and having to uh, kind of start. framework and I think it pull together your last comes and are they you know it's right after reading we that they would have to do on a week when they didn't have your stress levels really not too bad and uh students about checklists um and and a little bit creative but don't or you can kind of create your and be covering and then Structure that you can fill in after. As the time goes. I share some of her strategies. An example, and I. is a little template all of the stuff sort of pre pop things he says contact ed tech you know ambitious by all means go ahead what that looks like and how that something that um if you're thinking you know i just want to beautify my lessons i don't need to do a, a whole bunch more and uh we can support you in that here and it's it's this color we can make these courses look really professional because we want them to be professional as well. And so having a, a little bit more of that professional look, I but I will say, Roberto, your lessons look really great actually already. So please, uh, we're not trying to set like an unattainable bar here. We're just giving some options for people. Um, I had an asterisk around readings earlier. Um, I just want to remind you that if you are going to be doing a textbook adoption, uh, that will be happening through the campus store. Please do that as soon as possible. You could say link it and it actually says what your textbook is if you wanted to do that as well. Um, but just if students do need to order some. Use a textbook and you. Have 
a lot of material. They'll the steps of how you do that. It is accessible as far as possible, just so they're not And then finally, I'll make not all of them are there, uh, as uh, Jason was telling. Things even more open. Um, the icebreaker is your question, and I'd really like to think. I had things like making like a personality. Personality and I put it on a Pinterest board. So a seminar with T. The icebreaker. Uh, Entire the instructional support assistants who will be that you could potentially use into your large classes as an instructor or also uh, to help your TAs. The other thing that I had uh, been thinking about and was talking to a TA does each week is somebody has uh, you know it wouldn't take environment so you do it you get the marks but about as well to ensure that students feel part of really start to curate when you said that you wanted presentation and leave this in breakers um, and then at the end we can love and some people don't love okay so I uh, friends are you in the room Amazing. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure. Uh, online courses for quite some We had to pull you away from things. Workload manageable. It can be kind of over. Sure. Thank you for um anyway.
teach um, it's a first year course and it was and so on and the other over 80 now quite intimate and small going online is is to keep that intimacy was was challenging forms for every module in my course. I create it and they must do two um, and spring term course they do I do eight What I learned when I a lot in my final grade. Terms a lot in the max allotment to twenty-five, thinking I was. intense and the initial course and offering students the opportunity over to the value of their forums and whether that was going to this about the structure and how I use the TAs to make into a final paper before that's complete uh, normally if studies on you know do through advice working with Jill Gross was So drawing on your peers' work and learn more about. So then you might ask, okay, forms. So on the reply forum. They have to talk about and then the conditions of the forum post is are you in, you are integrating scholarly academic peer-reviewed whatever you'd like to refer to it as a uh, source and you may also add a popular source so in the case of hockey a lot of the current facts and figures of the game that they might include in their forum reply to my question is more in popular sources and then more of uh, kind of empirical research drawing on that theoretical stuff comes from the academic so um, you have to include the academic and then you can add the popular. So you can imagine um, how robust these get and it's you can set a limit of about a paragraph, I'd say, but students write far more. They really get into it. So in the case of my spring course, they're doing 16 of these that count towards. I mark them out at 10 for each one. 
So 160 marks that get converted down to 50%. In the case of a term, if you do 10 modules for two, that's 20 posts, uh, 200 marks that get converted down to 50%. Now, in terms of the TAs, um, what you really need to get is a TA who's super comfortable communicating online. And secondly, a TA who will commit to very in-depth and quick turnaround on their marking. So I put around an in-depth of and um modules that would be two and what the intention and reinforce how they and then as the term students at writing the post I'll do a one-off paper and there's nothing iterative or ongoing about it they don't get a second kick at the can well they definitely get several kicks at the posts and they will use that feedback at the beginning so my advice on that is to um to really be intense and and intentional you can use your first module as a trial post so i use one like what does hockey mean to me so everybody just gets on the forum tool gets used to the technical way to post, writes some stuff, and begins to interact in a very low risk environment because it's not being assessed. And then you kick into gear with module two, counting it, and uh, decide how many more you want to count towards your and how much value you'd like to give to it. Um, I guess that's kind of everything. What Julie, happens with um, the feedback sorry, as well? Uh, as I, okay, oh, yeah, go ahead. sorry. I was gonna say there is a question, um, so, uh, but just to leave some space for that, but go ahead about the feedback. I would, I okay. do want to hear that. So well. the TAs give the, the detailed feedback in Sakai for each post to each student and then enter the mark out of 10 into grade books. So they'll have 20 or 16 form entries in grade book that shows each one. But I also do an announcement after each post where my TAs give me a summary of the main themes, some exemplar posts by students, I give some feedback on what the average was just to let everybody know, because I really like to see how the average improves and demonstrate that to the class to show as a cohort of getting better. So I always do an announcement and a very encouraging announcement. I find on an online course, you have to be super, super um, positive. You have to go over what you might think you do in face to face because they can't pick up on your facial mannerisms and so on of how much you really do support the students. So you have to demonstrate that in your communication on on, uh, on Sakai. So I use exemplars. So I'll create a particular page on my Sakai called Forum Feedback, and I'll have all those details with key themes that come across, key points for improvement, key strengths of the posts, and a couple of exemplars for each of those, you know, 20 or so forum posts under each module. So happy to answer questions here. Julia, could you cue me? Because I do see it. Yeah, I have no, let me, and I would like to read them out just because uh, for the recording's sake, I realize that if we <laughs> just read them and answer that no, the recording doesn't know what we asked. So Ned asks a great question. If you think that this kind of assignment um, would work for first year students who have little or no experience with scholarly discourse. Um, and then she kind of answers her own question. Um, but uh, I, about how um, being really clear uh, with rubrics about what is expected, and you kind of address that as well. But I, just maybe some insights if you've tried it with um, like your incoming right. students and what that would so look like. Okay, so Ned, I think there's two elements to what you're asking. So one, in terms of communication, getting on the forum posts and writing content, yes, they're into that. They do it when they text with their peers, students. They're they're quite good at that. In terms of that 
discourse you're referring to, I think you could really channel it by the kinds of questions you use to direct your forums. So, you know, there is a couple of courses in sport management I've taught that were first year with seminars. We've lost a lot of courses with seminars. But think about what your TA or your seminar leader would do in the seminar and then kind of, you know, channel or direct or structure your forum that way. So, yes, I think so. And I get this question a lot, and so uh, Roberto's asking it right now about how stu how um, TAs give the feedback or how is that feedback given. So I get asked, you know, do I give that directly in the forum or do I do it privately separately? So if you could address how you would uh, you did that, I I have lots of ideas, but I'd love to hear what you did. So I just have the TAs go in. They're assigned to their forum group. You open a, a post and you can click on the feature to grade. And that opens up um, a page where you've got a text box where you put your comments in and you submit the mark. And then if you've set it up to count towards final or and you sync it to what category of uh, assignment it's in your gradebook, it automatically populates the mark in gradebook. So students can go in and see what the comment is on their end. So the TAs uh, directly input through Sakai. And so that's, also what that's I between find the TAs and private. So that's private between the TAs and the, uh, the students. So that, that's only seen by the student, that kind of grade feedback. Correct. Um, and do you do broader feedback for the whole forum? Yes, that's correct. It only goes direct to the student. And um, it actually is, you know, you ask your TAs to, the way they, they give the feedback to be conversational, um, I really say to the TAs, invest the time to be robust in that feedback. I tend to find TAs over time, just my experience with the ones I've had, tend to go thin on feedback. And uh, so put the, put the hours there because the more they use at the end, you will make up at the back end because at some point, the, report, the feedback to students who are just in a groove with these posts is just well done, hit the mark. And that's all the TA says at that stage. So the hours I've allocated for the TA to write that at the end, yes, they've read it, but they've invested it at the beginning of the term with the time. And then Andre's asking about the length. You kind of mentioned a paragraph, but do you have like a word count that you um, aim for or do you just let them go to it? Yeah, I've had some difficulty uh, figuring that out because sometimes I try and say, um, you know, a paragraph. So even if you say half a page, so I don't know, does a page have 250 words or something? Yep. This is single spaced. So, um, you know, single spaced post might be a couple hundred, 175, but students always go past it because what happens is you get one student in a forum group that goes past it, a couple paragraphs, and then they all kind of follow that. So um, a paragraph might be short, paragraph and a half where it's kind of a long block of text or two short paragraphs, but with a word total from there. Um, so there's there's a technical question, which I'm not sure you know the answer to, that they're asking about Turnitin integration or some kind of uh, phrase matching software inside of forums, which does not exist. And if you were to do a copying and pasting, I think that would be a lot of work. Um, what you could do is have your final assignment, that reflection, go through Turnitin, and then you would know at the end of it. Um, I'm just going to answer that for you, Julie. Um, there was another question about, oh yeah, these are more technical about putting with the comment boxes. Lindsay's asking, do you, do you allow your students to see their classmates post prior to writing their own post? Some people um, disable that. And yes. They have to, yeah. Yes. And it actually probably decreases uh, plagiarism because they know the TA is reading all the posts and they, they can't say the same thing their posts, their partners or their peers have said. not just that forum group because students may pick any peers forum post for their paper. So if you have a huge class and you've got something like 15 forum groups or more, um, it becomes a very robust knowledge pool for students to pull, uh, pull from for their final paper. I will I will uh, acknowledge though we have had somebody with classes of, of about a thousand you trying to use forums and because you could have hundreds of forums yeah. in, in that situation that um, there has been a case where somebody has snatched somebody else's post 
Um, and so that, that requires communication among <laughs> um, all the, the TAs if you're going to do something in that large size. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Now, maybe you can section and you uh, can have a number of uh, forum groups that a TA manages, and then you don't open it up for students to see all sections, but maybe their section has like five or six forum groups in it. And that would be more than enough of a pool to pull from if you went with some other kind of assignment to, that uh, uses the peer posts. Um, Jack, Jackie's asking about max number of students per forum. I don't know if she's asking like pedagogically or technically. Technically, there's no limit, <laughs> but pedagogically, um, uh, do you have you tried different sizes? Your what yeah, are so eight to ten. I find right. it gets down to six. It's a little too thin. Uh, not as big as a seminar would be face to face, though, which is twenty. Yeah. So I'd some people some 10. people do 20 quite successfully but they're not doing heavy writing so like right. it might you know because you're doing 50 percent of the mark that probably makes a lot of sense to do a group of eight to ten uh, and you're managing those manually the groups you're creating those yourself like in um, Sakai I do initially although um they're randomized but I use the tool and because what happens in hockey well I mean everybody's course you'd have a few drops at the beginning so if you use, if you set a few up, uh, if you set them up, you go through module one, which is just a trial, have fun kind of post. You see how your enrollment might adjust after the um, first week. Then you might move some people around and then be locked in as of module two to balance out your form groups or just roll with it. Maybe go yeah. up to 12 in a group. And if you have a couple drop out, you're still at 10 and it won't impact that group. I know that we've already kind of submitted to the registrar, but I will again give the pitch to use the built-in seminar system and that some people have been very creative about how they set those up. So like the TA contract is still for 20 students, but they've said my seminars are 10 students. And then so a TA contract, even though it's 20 students is two groups. Um, so you can be, you can actually have that management take, be taken care of for you. Um, Julie, this all this kind of stuff predates your your work, but if people are like now that everybody's doing it, maybe we can kind of shift that of how what that groups look like. So I've had people do groups of five, even like biology has done that. Um, okay, so I don't I we do have I did want to hear from Netta. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, I really your your experience is really invaluable because you've been on the ground and you've done it. I think what five times now is that I, I think, think that's six. Count? Yeah, six I taught times. it this spring, kind of last minute. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. fun. So, and I, I feel like every time you've iterated and you just made it so much better. So I really appreciate you coming and sharing your, your experience. Thank you so much. Thanks, bye um, everybody. Bye Julie. Um, and so this was, I wanted to put this back out to the general group, but um, Netta did sign up. So I didn't put your name Netta, but you're, I would love to hear what, you, what you're thinking and what your plans are. And um, if you wanna just kind of share with us it, a little bit it, of that. It's sort of funny because like I'm, I have never, I have no experience, right? But I've sort of thought that I need to start early so that if people have questions, um, I can enthusiastically and helpfully respond. Um, and I've also been watching my kids do online learning and seeing what works for them and what absolutely does not work for them. So um, like I've become the big advocate of asynchronous learning because I can see what happens to my girls when they spend like two or three hours in front of the computer. So I've really been trying to raise so that that I'm I'm instructing students. OK, like go away now, read something, think about something, maybe draw something, take a picture of it on your phone and upload it later. Right. Like I'm really trying to to break the course up into little bits and pieces um, and understand that 21st century learners like kids drop into conversations all the time like they go from one social media conversation to another they're that like they're actually really good at doing that um, and I just have to get over my way of what I think a lecture a lesson needs to do so James and I were talking this morning about like, I'm, so my class, it's not even a, a that big a class, it's liter, but it's a, it's an intro class, right? It's intro to literary theory. And, you know, it's a 90 minute course. Um, 
and uh, you know I lecture for that long and I and I break it up by doing little activities and I'm just going to have to do that but the act it, so it's like 10 minute lecture then like do something else like whether it's a forum posting or a little poll or I'm going to encourage them to like get out of their rooms right go find you know an example of like do a feminist reading of like a billboard or like do you know like look at your own space do a semiotic reading of your own room or whatever like just trying to like it's actually like and i'm and i'm trying to make everything that i can um like that they can at least access on their phone um, even though that's not perfect and my para PowerPoint slides will not be good on the phone, obviously, <laughs> and like the readings that they have to do, you know, but I want them to act, be able to access the syllabus on the phone. I'm making tons and tons of little stupid videos. I'm using like a whiteboard thing and snag it so I can draw on the whiteboard and make a video over that of that. Um, and I'm only building the first two lessons. Those are the only two that will be canned so that they can like so I can release the course to them like I, I do that anyway because I was like we're going to start you know working with the scarlet letter like in week two so you have to read the novel now like I do that anyway um and so yeah I created um I gave everybody the link last time uh, a liquid syllabus I did it through popular me because it's free and I just cut and paste everything from my syllabus and threw it in there and added pictures I even added a video which was kind of a pain but I figured out how to do it um, and I'm happy to teach anybody. Um, it's not a great website in terms of like instructions <laughs> um, so that they can. So I'm just trying to think of ways to get like I really like the idea. James was saying this like that um, this morning, but like they they still understand the schedule that I will be available during class time and I will set things up so that we're all staying together like at least within a 48 hour period. Do you know what I mean? Like, so activities will go live at a certain point and they'll disappear after a certain point, right? Like certain things, not everything obviously, but like little low stakes reading quizzes and and fun activities. Like they'll, you know, we're, we're trying to do, stay together on this. Um, and I think seminar discussions can be like this, like students miss seminar right and when they miss seminar for reals in real life you don't get a grade and that i think that should still be true like these low low stake seminar meetings like in forums and whatever it is and i think for first year um the kind of work that julie is expecting them to do i don't think is possible because they don't know how to do it yet but like that doesn't mean you can't still have seminar discussions forums discussions etherpad discussions like posting something on their student page you can't i think you need to make those things count but you can't expect that to be where they learn scholarly discourse like or they can practice little bits and pieces of it i mean dis everything disciplines are different but so that's that's what i'm thinking i don't know like i haven't done this before but i'm i'm trying I to think of visual tools on your phone tools, breaking things up tools, that kind of stuff. The one, the one thing that you just uh, highlighted around, you know, getting out of your seat, like that is yeah. one thing that keeps me up at night is I don't want these students sitting here and just doing things on their computer 24 seven, like optometrists yeah. might like us in a few years, but right now it's what kind of assignments can you get them to go and do an observation and then come back and reflect on that in a forum or you, like you said, look around the room and what do they see and how does that link into their, their content? So definitely wanna... things that take them away from the computer, I think is would make that learning experience that much better that it's not not just here that I'm learning, but it's like in my world. So yeah. And I mean, it's hard, but I would like to encourage them to like it's and especially for those of us who work with things like books, which is so fun. Um, like go tell me where you're reading. What is your reading space look like? Right. Um, and and if you're reading everything on computer, have you thought about printing some of it out so that you can take it elsewhere to read? like and so that you can mark it up and I want I want them I want to be able to have for them like here's a link for like a really really easy um 
app so that you can turn your phone into a scanner. So if you're taking notes on a page, you can just scan it or take a picture of it and you can upload that. You know, I want like responses to there to be a range of the kinds of responses that they can give, especially in the kind of seminar portion of the class where usually they just be talking and thinking and maybe, you know what I mean? Um, so that it's not just like, uh, 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 like that's, I, I think, um, I think that's just going to be hard for them. That's all. <laughs> so those are the, those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing and thinking out loud with us because I know I think everybody's kind of in that space where we're like, I'm just trying to work this out. So I appreciate you being a little a lot, bit vulnerable yeah. to share that and with us. It's a lot of work, right? So that when people have questions, I can try to answer them. I'm doing a lot of thinking on now, but I do see the point where this is going to be set up. And even though the lectures aren't going to be canned, because I'm not going to do I'm not going to do that. I don't want it to be a course that's like done. I want to be lecturing, preparing my lecture videos, which are only going to be like 20 minutes, like 10 minutes and 10 minutes. Because all the other stuff is going to be other kinds of learning. Um, I want to do those as the course goes on so I can be responding to, to students. Um, but I can see that once it's built and once I decide on the structure, that's I'll be done with that. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Derek that's and all. Derek is agreeing with you about building them towards this idea. So that's um, we hear you. Um, I, I just I'm trying to be aware of the time we we used up a lot of time. Uh, I could have just actually had all of you guys share <laughs> during this moment. Um, so this is where we've gone so far. And my last question there was like, what are the gaps? Um, but we just want to reiterate this point about um, the four core priorities for trauma-informed distance learning that, you know, building the structure, this framework, but still op providing mm -hmm. these opportunities for connection, being flexible um, to allow empowerment, which I think is very much uh, in line with what we've just heard uh, that your plan is. So um, if, if you leave with one thing, please, or four things, I suppose, um, let's keep those in mind. Um, uh, Madeline, do you want to talk about our plans this summer? Sure. So um, as many of you know, we've had a number of these different sessions. I think we've had uh, by the end of June, it'll be 33 workshops we will have done in June with approximately 500 or so uh, participants. So huge success, uh, but a lot of work. So uh, and we've really mobilized our team to bring all these great people together to provide insights. Uh, so moving forward through the summer, what our focus is now is to have uh, time for individual consults. So even right now, if you start thinking, okay, I've got a bit of a framework, I'd like some feedback on this, or I'm trying to figure out what to do with this portion of my course, we are more than happy to do individual consults with an ed tech person and an ed dev uh, educational developer so we can really work through both of those pieces. Uh, we will continue to have Sakai and assessment workshops that will be delivered through August. Those are pretty popular and so and we have a feeling we'll have lots uh, more asked for those. TA supports. There is what I was referring to before, the instructional uh, supports assistants who will be helping to uh, provide TAs with the resources and skills that they need to be effective in your courses. So we will be sending out a bit of a needs assessment slash survey to faculty to say, what are the top three things that you will need your TAs to do? So then we can start building some of our resources uh, around that. Uh, we will also be creating an asynchronous type of course in Sakai with sort of the leading practices. So a course on how to de develop courses, <laughs> um, but demonstrating all of these different types of techniques. As Julia said, we've just been do going full steam with these workshops to really create that community and get people talking and thinking. But now we want to pull all this information into a, a space that's curated in a really useful way. So please watch for those. Um, and then the last which many of you may be part of this is a bit of our proactive outreach. So once the timetable is finalized, which I think maybe that's today, <laughs> um, once we see that, uh, we're going to look through and really identify those courses that have a ton of students, but also uh, that may be having uh, more international students, different types of kind of 
uh, things that we need to really consider within our design. And we'll be doing a proactive reach out around that. As you know, CPI has generally been uh, coming to us whenever you want, but we also want to make sure that you're set up for success. And there's always just some of those little tiny things in behind the scenes that you might not have thought of that might create problems for you. So we want to make sure we, we go through all of those pieces with you. So that's our plans for the summer. Uh, but really reach out to us at any time. The EdTech is the best place to go because it's checked by the team and we'll make sure that we get back to you as, as quick as possible. And Julia, I'll, also, I'll leave the last yeah. to you. Yeah, great, thanks. I'll just also point out that uh, some people get a, a little bit, a, a group together and wanna have a kind of mini workshop on a particular theme or topic, and we're always happy to do that. So if you know, like within your discipline or program or just, you know, your buddies wanna get together and be like, you have a very specific thing, please reach out again. So when we say individual, that could also be like a group of, of five and we could do something like that. So please, um, you know, think outside of the, the, the individual consult. Um, and then finally, um, so two things here. A lot of you asked, how is how where is this these feedback forms and how is that being done? So at forms.office.com is where you can create your own forms. Um, immediately, and then it's exported. feedback about what you need last um thing in a series again we can I appreciate your feedback and your ongoing participation so check out other Um, I'm going to stop the